Hello there and welcome to Inside Intercom. I'm Liam Geraghty. Today we're looking at some more of Intercom's product principles, which means I'm joined by Intercom brand editor Neve O'Connor. Hey Neve. Hey Liam. So far in this occasional series, we've looked at principles like delivering outcomes, keeping it simple, how following design fundamentals leaves space for innovation. So what are we looking at today and who with? Well, today we're going to hear from Wahid El Maladi, staff product engineer here, who's going to be talking about how technical conservatism helps to scale faster and better. But first, we're going to go to Intercom principal product designer Gustav Cyrilus to hear how connected modular systems help us to focus on important decisions. When I joined Intercom eight years ago, I knew nothing about system design. I designed and presented my ideas using high fidelity mockups. They were quick to put together, and so I assumed that even wireframes were a waste of time, let alone system design diagrams. But when I shared these designs with others to get feedback, we'd get sidetracked by seemingly small interaction design details, when in reality, we just had different mental models for how the system should work. Months after the solution was shipped, we'd learned that we'd made a fundamental mistake in our solution. Because I was designing at the UI level, not the system level, we were not focusing on the most important questions. Our chief product officer, Paul Adams, introduced me to the idea of creating systems, not destinations. This idea was a core part of our design process. Initially, it was implicit, but later formalized into a design principle, connected modular systems. So let's break it down and look at each part of this design principle in more detail. System design is a representation of how your solution works conceptually. What are the objects in your system and how does the data flow between them? Typically, it's presented as a diagram. You'll find the diagram linked in the show notes. It's a system design diagram that we use to design the Art Articles product. It demonstrates how teammates manage their help center content, how users consume that content, how teammates can send that content when responding to users, and how a feedback loop continuously improves the content quality. Without the distraction of a mock-up of a screen, we were able to get aligned on how the product should work. By first focusing on the system and not the interaction design, you can ensure that you're debating the most important questions first and aligning on how the solution should work at the high level without getting bogged down by the minor details. The same system can be implemented in many different ways when it comes to interaction and visual design. By working through system interaction and visual design layers gradually, you can ensure that the right feedback is given at the right time. For example, there's no use of sweating the visual design details if you're not aligned on the system. By designing systems first, you can focus on the most important questions without getting lost in the finer details. But designing too many systems can also lead to a product that is difficult to understand and expensive to maintain. That's where modular systems come in. A modular system is a system that you create once and reuse in many different contexts. This idea is not new and is used across a range of industries from home, construction, to standard shipping containers, to increase efficiency and reduce costs. Back in 1908, Sears, Roebuck and company took advantage of modular systems when they started to sell entire houses through their mail order catalogs. They were prefabricated and all of the necessary parts to build the house were shipped to customers across the US. As a result, Sears significantly reduced manufacturing costs and passed along the savings in lower prices to their customers. You are likely already familiar with the concept of connected modular systems if your product has a design system, a library of reusable UI components and patterns. Design systems can greatly increase team efficiency and product consistency since you design and build the UI components once and then use them throughout the product. The idea of modularity can be applied beyond UI components. Here's an example. Intercom customers can set up automated messages to engage their customers when they match certain criteria. Initially, we only had simple in-app messages and email, but over time, we added more and more ways to engage customers, such as SMS, product tours, banners, etc. While we used the same design system in the UI, it was more efficient to build the technical capabilities as separate systems since each of them had slight nuances. As a result, each of these message types had similar yet slightly different capabilities. 
For example, they could target different audiences. Some had A-B testing, some had goals, etc. They were difficult to maintain and improve because whenever we wanted to make an improvement that would benefit all message types, you would have to update all of them individually. In the long run, this was slowing us down, constraining what our customers could do with them and made it difficult for us to create a solution for orchestrating how all of them should work together. To fix this problem, we took on a project to rationalize all of these desperate systems and come up with one modular system that can be used for all message types. Now, whenever we make an improvement to the system, all message types automatically benefit from it. With modular systems, you can increase your efficiency by having a small number of powerful and flexible systems, but the real magic happens when you connect these systems together. A big reason why Apple create amazing products is that they are vertically integrated. Apple designs their own hardware, software, services, and even the retail experience. This way they can control the entire customer experience and are able to seamlessly integrate their hardware and software, whereas some of their competitors can only work within the constraints of the hardware that they get. By making sure your systems are connected and integrated with the rest of your product, you can gain similar strategic advantages, such as differentiation from competitors, so the ability to gain new capabilities that are only possible through multiple integrated systems. And also business mode, making it more difficult for competitors to copy your solutions as they would have to copy multiple systems. For example, product tours were primarily designed to help onboard new customers after they sign up. But because Intercom can also be used for supporting existing customers, we designed them in such a way that you could also send them via bots, the inbox, banners, help articles, and email. It wouldn't have been worth the effort to build product tours just for this customer support use case, but by connecting them to our customer support suite of tools, we were able to produce it at a low cost and provide a differentiated solution for our customers. That's how connected modular systems can help you focus on the right questions, increase efficiency, and differentiate from competitors. Reflecting back on my own journey at Intercom and towards my internalization of this principle, I believe it's one of the foundational ideas that has helped me become a better designer and help the team build a successful product. Nowadays, whenever I start thinking about solutions for a new project, I start by designing the system I've learned that by focusing on the system in the early stages, instead of skipping ahead to high fidelity mockups, gets us talking about the important decisions faster. That was Gustav's service, principal product designer. Next up, we're going over to Wahid Al Maladi, staff product engineer, to hear about how technical conservatism helps us scale faster and better. At Intercom, we're focused on the future and we're taking bold steps to get there. But when we make technical decisions, we like to be conservative. In practice, being technically conservative looks like reusing existing technologies and frameworks in our stack or promoting tried and tested patterns and solutions. We value this familiarity because we understand that the important problems to be solved are the ones that deliver customer or business value. Instead of evaluating new technologies and spending time on already solved operational problems that ultimately provide little customer value, we can focus on improving the product by building, releasing and iterating on solutions. There are many long-term benefits to technical conservatism. This principle is best illustrated by a few examples from over the years. Demonstrating how be technically conservative allows us to scale fast while ultimately not being a constraint. I've spoken previously about our experience of, of designing our reporting system while we evaluated the benefits of introducing a new data store to our stack, Redshift. It would have meant introducing a new type of database to our system that had never been tested against production. Furthermore, we would have had to spend a lot of time building up operational knowledge, maintaining clusters in production, and dealing with unforeseen issues from operating Redshift at scale. Ultimately, we decided that a familiar data store was better suited to the job. We leveraged our existing Elasticsearch infrastructure, which powers the majority of Intercom's search capabilities, 
to speed up the process from an estimated six months to just six weeks. The initial version of the reporting system shipped a few years ago now, so we've had an opportunity to reflect on some of the longer term benefits of our application of technical conservatism in that case. We solved the customer's problem faster. Using our existing infrastructure meant we avoided spending time familiarizing ourselves with a new data store and dealing with all the inevitable hiccups. We were able to immediately focus on the customer problem to be solved and shipped fast, reducing delivery time by more than four months. We made the most of the team's time. Our data infrastructure team were able to continue to focus on a small, familiar set of technologies instead of being spread across multiple. As a result, they had, and still have, more time to ensure the health of our existing systems and optimize our use of each technology. We compounded the value of ongoing improvements. Because our set of technologies is relatively small, improvements happen regularly. The product leverages those technologies and so the impact of those improvements is compounded across everything built on top of them. A tiny improvement can have a massive positive ripple effect across the entire product. More teams have had more input. Using common technologies means that more engineers and teams feel confident and empowered to work with them. We've seen frequent improvements to the reporting product from teams across the company, rather than just one team that owns a particular part of the system. Remember that principles aren't rules, they're guidelines. Principles are an incredible way to align teams and have yielded great results for Intercom, but there are times when it might make more sense not to follow them. As a company scales, there's a risk that some team members will follow the principles dogmatically or interpret them incorrectly. Defaulting to technical conservative should not mean that we never introduce something new. Technical conservatism means favoring a technology that's already in your stack, but only if it's the best option. In some situations, an existing technology might not be suitable. If it can't answer the following questions, we might look further and evaluate alternatives. Does the new tool allow your business to scale more effectively? Does it allow your team or org to move faster and deliver value more quickly? Does it solve a customer problem that couldn't be solved with your existing tools? If you answer yes to any of these questions, it may be worth consider introducing that new tool. At Intercom, there was a recent example that answered yes to all three questions. Users or our customers' customers are core to the Intercom platform. As we have grown, so have our customers and their needs in terms of how much user data they store within Intercom. The vast quantity of user data was leading to scaling issues with our current user data store at the time. And to ensure we could continue to support existing and new customers, we needed to rethink our current solution. That ultimately led us to introduce a new technology to our stack. And here's how we arrived at this decision. We were scaling faster than our data store would allow. We had been using MongoDB for roughly five years and had the operational scars to prove it. We had optimized every aspect of owning it and running it, from the type of hardware it ran on to the queries we ran on it. We were at the point of diminishing returns and were seeing strong signals that it would stop being fit for purpose within a couple of years and might even become a bottleneck in the company's growth. This is where having a strong, forward-thinking technical strategy is key. At this point, we had enough data to suggest that we might need to evaluate another approach and had the runway to do it. Regularly think about the trajectory of your business and ask, will what get us here get us there? This will allow you to be proactive about your choices rather than reactive and mitigates the risks around the unknown unknowns of introducing a new technology. Our technology was slowing down our team. At Intercom, we strive to run less software. In this case, even though we are adopting a new technology with unknown unknowns, adopting DynamoDB allowed us to do just that. Previously, we were self-managing the scaling of MongoDB along with the code for balance and load, a significant overhead for the team. Part of the draw of DynamoDB was that it was managed by the vendor, AWS. This meant that although there was initial cost to adopting it, ultimately it would be cheaper and save the team a huge amount of time and effort. 
It may seem counterintuitive, but introducing a new technology ultimately resulted in us running less software. Not being dogmatic about technical conservatism enabled us to replace a technology with large overheads and limited capabilities with a new technology that was less burdensome, operationally and more scalable. We were ruthless about requirements. We would sometimes require MongoDB to perform complex and expensive queries that risked availability and the performance of more common but less complex queries. When evaluating DynamoDB, we realized that it wouldn't support those complex and expensive queries, but it would be much better at the simpler and more common ones. We already mostly used Elasticsearch to perform complex queries, and the need to migrate forced us to review and more deliberately define the capabilities we required from our user store and ultimately allowed us to improve performance for its primary use case, which was retrieving single user records. When thinking about replacing a technology, don't just take it for granted that you will use the new technology in the same way. Your requirements will likely have changed considerably over time and the rest of the stack will have evolved or mature so that use cases become more narrow. This will open up opportunities to adopt more focused, performant technologies or offload some technologies to be managed by them. Make your principles work for your business, not the other way around. Technical conservatism is a great tool for allowing your teams to stay focused on what's important. Solving customer problems and delivering value without spending precious resources on answering questions that have already been answered. However, becoming too rigid in the belief that introducing new technologies is bad could prevent you from taking advantage of technologies that will help you run less software and scale more easily and quickly. It's important to apply this principle in a way that works best for your team and your business in the long term. That was Wahid El Maladi, and this is an ongoing series both here on the podcast, but also on the Inside Intercom blog, right? Exactly. You can read all about our product principles over on the blog, complete with diagrams and illustrations to further expand on them. There's also a link to them all in the show notes. Great. Thanks so much, Neve. Well, that's about all the time we have for today, but do join us next week. Thanks for listening.